near and far. Um, we're so blessed to have all of you here. Um, now, uh, the key text for today is Psalms 144, verse 15. Happy is that people that is in such a case, and happy is that people whose God is the Lord. Um, now, uh, I'd like to ask Alex if he could please have the open prayer. trying to find ways to be happy, but many times they don't know how to do that, and sometimes the problem is that either they don't know what true happiness is, or they're looking in all the wrong places. But before I go into my study, I'd like to have a small story for the children, so I'd like to ask all the children to come forward to the front please. to go around and see everything that he could. And one day he happened to come upon a village. And in the village, in a small house, he saw a big bowl of fruit on the table. And in the bowl were two big shiny apples. And the monkey couldn't help himself. He had to go and he had to go get those apples. So he went and he crept into the house and he grabbed the apples and he went to take a bite, but he couldn't bite into it. The apples were made of wood, they weren't real apples. So the monkey still decided that they must have been worth something. I mean, these apples looked so beautiful. So he took them in his hands and he went back into the jungle. But the monkey started to get hungry. And unfortunately, these apples, they weren't real apples. He couldn't do anything with them. And he saw a big tree with a lot of bananas in it. And he wanted to climb that tree and get those bananas. But he couldn't because he was holding the apples in his hands. So the monkey started to get really hungry, but he didn't want to let go of the apples because they were so beautiful. So basically, what this story is trying to tell us is that sometimes in life, the things that we think are really important and we hold dear to us are actually the things that are keeping us from really being happy. Thank you for coming up to the prize. Um, so in the world today, we see that a lot of people try to find happiness in different places. One of the ways that people often look for happiness is through riches. Um, now, can we obtain true riches through happiness? Sorry, true happiness through riches? Is this possible? Um, could you please turn with me to Ecclesiastes 5, verse 10? And I'd like to do something a little different this evening. Um, if you guys would be willing, I'd like to have everybody from the audience to read the verses so that you can be a little more engaged. So if I could please have a volunteer read Ecclesiastes 5, verse 2. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. Thank you. So this verse is telling us that we cannot be satisfied with silver, with riches, with things like that. This is only the kind of happiness that will not satisfy us for very long. And we read in Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, at the foundation of the ruin of many homes lies the passion for display. Men and women scheme and plan to get means in order that they may appear richer than their neighbors. But even though they may succeed, 
in their desperate struggle, they are not truly happy. From the worldly point of view, money is power, but from a Christian standpoint, love is power. Here love has special efficacy to do good and can do nothing but good. It prevents discord and misery and brings the truest happiness. So we see here in this writing that our view of happiness cannot be the same as the world's. Everywhere we look, everybody is trying to be more successful. Everyone is trying to build themselves up through money. But we see here that that is not the true way to happiness. <coughs> now, what about looking for fun things to do? Can we find happiness if we're constantly looking for amusements? Uh, let's read 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 6. Chapter 5 and verse 6 of 1 Timothy. But she that liveth from pleasure is dead while she liveth. Thank you. So it says here that a person who is living in pleasure is dead while they're still living. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound very happy to me. Um, it, by trying to find happiness in our own pleasures, we end up very quickly running out of the happiness that it gives us because it doesn't give us the lasting time that we truly need. And in Councils on Health, page 627, it says, Men may teach that trifling amusements are necessary to keep the mind above despondency. The mind may indeed be thus diverted for a time being, but after the excitement is over, calm reflection comes. Conscience arouses and makes her voice heard, saying, This is not the way to obtain true health and happiness. There are many amusements that excite the mind, but depression is sure to follow. So we see here that this is not a way that we can find happiness either. Um, and if we look further, um, let's read Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 4. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 4. The soul of the, of the sluggard desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Thank you. So it says that the soul of the sluggard has nothing. What is a sluggard? Does anyone know what that word means? Yes. It's a lazy person. Yes, a sluggard is someone who's very lazy. So it says <coughs> in the present truth, paragraph 3, that God never designed that men should live in idleness. Those who are always busy who go cheerfully about to perform their daily tasks are the most happy and healthy. In these verses, we see that in order to be happy, we need to do what God desires for us to do, which is not to find our own amusements and to find our own pleasures or trying to get away with doing the least amount possible. God's plan for us is to be working and to be happy and healthy. And if we look in the Bible, we can see God's original plan for human beings. If we turn to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. This verse tells us about what God's plan was for Adam and Eve when they originally created him. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. So we see here that God could have put Adam in any place. He could have put him in a big, beautiful palace with servants to serve him. But instead, he put him in a very humble place. He put him in a garden, somewhere where he would be required to maintain it. He would be required to work hard in order to be happy. And we see in Patriarchs and Prophets, page 50, to the dwellers in Eden was committed the care of the garden, to dress it and to keep it. Their occupation was not wearisome, but pleasant and invigorating. God appointed labor as a blessing to man. Those who regard work as a curse are cherishing an error. Our creator, who understands what is for man's happiness, appointed Adam to do the work. The true joy of life is found only by working men and women. Now, God gives us specific promises for those who are to do physical labor. And in Psalms chapter 128, verse 2, we read that, For thou shalt eat the labor of thine hands. Happy shalt thou be, and it shall be well with thee. So it's saying in this verse that 
everything that we do for ourselves, uh, we'll be more happy because we are the ones that accomplished it. How many of you like to cook? Okay. How many of you like to eat? Yeah, all the hands go up. But um, do you guys remember last weekend when we all made pizzas at the church? Now, would we have enjoyed those pizzas as much if we had just ordered them from Pizza Pizza? <laughs> Probably not, because we were the ones that created those pizzas. We made them by ourselves, and because of that, we got to enjoy it even more, because we knew the work that went into it. And it's the same uh, thing that God wills for us as well, that when we work harder, that we will also achieve more happiness to it. Now, when we are talking about working, can we achieve happiness if we're only working for ourselves? Or do we have to do something else? Let's read Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4. Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So we see here that we can't just be worrying about our own problems, but we also have to be trying to help others as well. And in Steps with Christ, page 124, we read that happiness is sought from, that is sought from selfish motives outside the path of duty is ill-balanced, fitful, and transitory. It passes away. The soul is filled with loneliness and sorrow. So this is not the kind of happiness we want. Um... In a presentation that was done about the topic of happiness, the presenter decided that he would show the audience what happiness truly meant. So he got the audience to each take their uh, balloon and write their name on that balloon. And then he put all the balloons in a room on the side. And he told the audience, okay, now you have five minutes. You're going to go to the room and you're going to try to find your balloon. And everybody was looking for their balloon. They tried everything. But nobody could find the balloon that belonged to them in five minutes. It just caused confusion. And then he said again, go back to the room. I'm going to give you five minutes. And you're going to take the balloon of someone else and give it to them. And obviously anyone can do that. They grabbed the balloon and they were able to exchange them. And everyone was able to find their balloon. So the lesson that he was trying to teach here is that we can find happiness through helping others. And not just our own selfish gains. So what are some of the ways that we can help others? Let's turn to Acts chapter 20 and verse 35. Acts chapter 20 and verse 35 says, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak, and to remember that the word of the Lord, how it said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And in Councils for the Church, Page 127, it says, Seize every opportunity to contribute to the happiness of those around you. Sharing with them your affection, words of kindness, looks of sympathy, expression of appreciation, would to many a struggling young man be as a cup of cold water to a thirsty soul. A word of cheer, an act of kindness, would go far to lighten the burdens that are resting heavily upon the weary shoulders. It is unselfish <coughs> ministry that in which true happiness is found. So we see here that we need to have this unselfish spirit and constantly be trying to help others because we don't know in the way that we can impact them. And by trying to reach out to others, we may even be a witness to them in the end. Um, now, what is another important work that must be done for those around us in order for us to be happy? Let us turn to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. Matthew 5 and verse 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So part of the way that we are supposed to be helping others is through sharing our light with them, through sharing the gospel so that they may also get to know Jesus Christ. And in Christian Service 269, we read that those who give their lives to Christ-like ministry know the meaning of true happiness. Their interests and their prayers reach far beyond self. They themselves are growing as they try to help others. And by trying to help others, we will actually be helping ourselves and we'll be working through, towards our own salvation as well. 
Now, why must we spread God's message to others? Well, we read in John chapter 17, verse 13. John 17, verse 13, it says, And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. So, by spreading the gospel to others, we will not only be contributing to our own happiness, but others will also be made happy because they will know about Jesus. They will be told about the truth. And in doing so, they will also get to share this happiness. Now, does God promise that this work will always be easy? No, he doesn't. In John chapter 16, verse 20, we read, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. So nowhere in the Bible that it says, if you help others, you're going to have an easy life. It's going to be so, such a happy experience all the way. But we do know that God will be with us every step of the way, and all we have to do is trust in Him. Now, as people of God who are trying to help others, what are some of the troubles that we might face? Let us read 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. Chapter 3 and verse 12 of 2 Timothy. And it says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, persecution doesn't sound like a very happy thing to go through, does it? It doesn't say everyone that follows God will have a super easy life. No, it says we will suffer persecution. So you might be thinking, how does perse persecution make us happy? But God gives us comfort and assurance in the Bible. And we read in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 14, But and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of the terror, neither be troubled. <coughs> so we see here that even through the trials, that God will be with us, and he will strengthen us and protect us through all of that. Now, why does God allow us to go through difficulties if he wants us to be happy? Let us turn to Job chapter 23 and verse 10. Job chapter 23 and verse 10. It says, But he knoweth the way that I take. When he had tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So, when God allows us to go through trials, it is for our own benefit. He wants us to be perfected. And the only way for us to do that is if we go through hardships, which help us to come closer to Him. Now, should we be happy when God corrects us? Let's read cha Job chapter 5 and verse 17. Job 5 verse 17, and it says, Behold, happy is the man whom God corrected. Therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. Now, how many of you like being told by your parents when you're doing something wrong? Is it sometimes easy to hear from other people, oh, you shouldn't be doing this, you have to change? No, sometimes it's hard for us to hear that we are doing something wrong. We want to be told that we're always right, we're always good, but that's not always the case. And we see in this verse that God has our best interests at heart, and he wants us to improve in any way we can in our characters. And sometimes the only way to do this is for us to go through those trials. And we have to know that down the road, it will lead to ultimate happiness, but we do need to go through those trials before we can go through that. Now, let us read Mind, Character, and Personality, page 650, and it says, God seeks our real happiness. If anything lies in the way of this, he sees it must first be removed. He will thwart our purposes and disappoint our expectations and bring us through disappointments and trials to reveal to us ourselves as we are. Sin is the cause of all our woes. If we would have true peace and happiness of mind, sin must be removed. And we see that the only way for sin to be removed is for God to allow us to go through these trials so we can ultimately have a better character and more fit for heaven. Now we've already established that we can't find happiness through money. We can't find happiness through amusements, or through pleasing ourselves. So who do we have to look to in order to have happiness? Let us read Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. And I'd like to have a volunteer read this, please. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. 
I'm looking up to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Thank you. So the only source of true happiness for us is Jesus Christ himself. He is the only way that we can be truly happy. And if we read in Messages to Young People, page 410, it says, Believe in Jesus as one who pardons your sins. One who wants you to be happy in the mansions he has to prepare for you. He wants you to live in his presence, to have eternal life and a crown of glory. So Jesus has your best intentions at heart. All we have to do is look to him and allow him to make a change in our life so that we can be truly happy. Now what shows that we believe in Christ? Let us turn to John chapter 14 verse 21. In John chapter 14, verse 21, we read, He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself in him. So, when we love Christ, it will be shown by the way that we follow his commandments. And this will be something that comes naturally, not something that we have to work for. Now, why is it so important for us to follow God's commandment and his will for us? Let us turn to Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18. And it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy he is. So we see here that if we are keeping the law of God, we will be ultimately happy. And that's all that it takes for us to have this happiness. In Historical Sketches, page 187, we read, In complying with God's requirements, you will find a peace, contentment, and enjoyment that you will you have never had in the path of wild license and sin. It is only through the obedience of God's law that true happiness can be found. We must submit our will to God if we are to have His divine and eternal harmony in our souls. Now, God promised us happiness as long as we follow his commandments. What kind of happiness does God promise us if we follow him? Let us turn to John chapter 16, verse 22. God gives us a very specific promise there. It says, And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. So this is a special kind of joy. It is a joy that nobody can take from us. It is a kind that only comes from Jesus and by accepting him as our personal savior. Now, if we look in the world today, who would you say are the happiest people on earth? We can read about it in Psalms chapter 144 and verse 15. Psalms chapter 144 and verse 15 says, Happy is that people that in, is in such a case. Yea, happy is the people whose God the Lord is. So if we know that we have God as a personal Savior, if we know that he has our best interests at heart, if we know that we are going to a heavenly kingdom, we should not have any reasons to be unhappy, to be worried, because we should know that he will have our best interests at heart. And reading in Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, it says, If there is anyone who should be continually grateful, it is a follower of Christ. If there is anyone who enjoys real happiness, even in this life, it is a faithful Christian. We should be the happiest people on the face of the earth, and not begging pardon of the world of being Christians. So we should be the happiest people on this earth, not anyone else, not the richest person in the world, not the most famous person, but the people who have the message of Jesus Christ in their hearts. Now, what invitation does Jesus give to us personally every day? Let us read in Messages to Young People, page 408. It says, God's invitation comes to each youth. My son, give me thine heart. I will keep it pure. I will satisfy his longings with true happiness. God loves to make the youth happy, 
And that is why he would have them to give their hearts into his keeping, that all the God-given faculties of the being may be kept in a vigorous, healthful condition. Are you willing to give your hearts to God? Are you prepared to put your plans in his hands and trust him to do the best with them? And are you ready to allow Jesus to show you the true meaning of happiness? Now, going back to the original question, what is happiness? When I was preparing the sermon, I was trying to think of the best way to define this word. And no matter how many times I tried to think, there was this song that kept playing in my head that we'd always sing during Sabbath school. And the words of the song are, happiness is knowing that Jesus loves me. Happiness is knowing that God above me is looking over me and watching over me in love. Happiness is caring about somebody, and happiness is sharing with everybody, and happiness is willingness to lend a helping hand in love. Selfishness can only make you gloomy. Saying no makes your heart feel bad, but I'm going to do what Jesus wants me to, and then I'll never be sad. As we come to know Christ, and we grow to give our hearts to him, it is my wish and prayer that we will all be able to find the true meaning of happiness personally. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Caitlin, for that beautiful study. That's also one of my favorite songs as well. Um, now we will finish our uh, study with the hymn uh, number 15 in our blue books.
done for us. And thank you for bringing us all here together this weekend so that we may learn more about you and to learn more about the true meaning of happiness. Lord, be with us each individually and help us all to put this into practice. Please help us to strengthen our faith in you and help us to realize that there is no happiness in this world and that there is one, only one source of true joy that we may have. Lord, please be with us and help us to come closer to you and help us each to know you personally. I ask all these things and I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.